when you get a chance. So just as a background for how this issue came about, the FMP establishes a whole crab fishery with the exception of fishermen in New Jersey through Florida who can prove a history of claw landings. At the last uh, board meeting, we thought that there might be 46 claw fishermen, which was way more than we originally thought. There were fishermen in New York, too, and they're currently not exempted. And our task was to investigate catch and landing records to more fully understand this portion of the fishery. So what I did was I reached out to each of the states and I asked the following questions. Um, how many fishermen are landing claws? What's the poundage being landed? Are there any practices we should know about? Where is this occurring? And the goal of all of these questions is to understand the size of the fishery so that we could set an appropriate harvest standard for claws. So I'm going to go through what each of the states sent me. I'm going to be fairly brief given the time of day. Um, and then I will go into some biological data that I was sent that I think will be useful. So Maine, that's uh, a new one here. Maine does have a claw fishery. The number is confidential. And one of our concerns is that this is uh, mostly a personal consumption uh, claw fishery. So this is not going to be reflected in dealer reports. So the numbers that you see here on the chart are likely a significant underestimate to what the claw fishery actually is in Maine. Next we'll go on to New York. So New York has claw fishermen who first land whole crabs and then if they're not able to find a market for the whole crabs, they'll sell their claws. Uh, they're using lobster pots and fish pots in both federal and state waters. Um, the max landings here, are, these are not actual claw landings. These are uh, total landings in pounds reported on VTRs for all New York fishermen who reported to have sold claws. So since we know that all of their catch is not strictly claws, it's a combination of both whole crabs and claws, this is the max landings. This is a large overestimate of their claw landings, but um, it's kind of the best we've got right now, and it gives us an upper limit. Moving on to New Jersey, there are a significant number of unknowns in New Jersey, and that's mostly because their dealer reports don't differentiate between claws and whole crabs. So we don't know the number of claw fishermen. We don't know claw poundage. Uh, we also don't know location of harvest because the dealer reports, to my understanding, only give the port where that landing actually happened. Um, it's also pos possible for harvesters to fish and not report. And this happens if you don't have a federal permit and are fishing in state waters. Um, the data is collected through VTRs, so that would be missed if you are in state waters. Um, given that here, what this table shows is the number of New Jersey vessels landing Jonah crab. Uh, what I want to point out is, A, we don't know how many of these are landing claws, but also we have a variety of gears here, and we also have some vessels that have lobster permits and some that don't. So an issue for the board to decide is who can land claws? Do you have to have a lobster permit? What kind of gear can you use? Um, I'll go into that more in a second. Next would be Delaware. There are two claw fishermen in Delaware. Uh, their pounding is confidential, but they're fishing in federal waters. They're harvesting both claws. And I was told that they have a preference to harvest crabs uh, over four inches. And then finally, Maryland, I'm going to spend a little more time on them because their trip level data was probably um, the most robust. But there are 18 fishermen in total between 2000 and 2015. Total landings in 2014 were over 30,000 pounds. This is just claws. Um, that dropped to over 20,000 pounds in 2015. All landings per trip are under 4,500 pounds. Again, that number is large because it was driven by one or two very high trips. Um, but in general, the vast majority of these trips are quite small. 50% of fishermen average less than 50 pounds per trip. 80% of fishermen average less than 200 pounds per trip. And 60% of fishermen landed than less than 500 pounds of claws yearly. So again, this is generally very small landings. It's just driven by one or two large trips. Um, like New Jersey, we have a bunch of different gears here. Lobster pots, fish pots, gill nets. Uh, it's happening in state and federal waters, and they're harvesting both claws. So this table here shows the claw landings for all gears combined. 
the number of fishermen has slightly increased, um, but I would say the number of trips has increased, 70 trips in 2015. And then that highest year of pounded, pounds landed was in 2014 with over 30,000 pounds, pounds of claws landed. And then I was able to split out the Maryland data by gear. So we can see that the vast majority is landed by uh, lobster traps, but we also have a significant amount from gillnets and whelk pots. So I just wanted to point that out, um, that we do have multiple types of participants in the claw fishery. So next I'm going to go on to the biological data that was given. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So this was submitted by Derek Perry from Massachusetts. He is doing work as part of a SK grant to understand the biology of Jonah crabs. And so he has been measuring Jonah crabs and he's able to plot out the relationship between carapace width and claw height. So the blue dots in this graph are measurements of crabs from southern New England and the red dots are measurements from crabs uh, in Gulf of Maine and George's Bank. And then he was able to do a linear regression on this and in general, what we would expect is if a crab met that minimum size of four and three quarter inches, which is the black lines, then we would expect a claw height of about 1.3 inches or a little over 35 millimeters. So that is um, some of the biological data I was able to get. He was also able to look at the relationship between carapace width and claw length. So again, uh, the blue dots are measurements from southern New England. The red dots are measurements from Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank. If we had that minimum size claw of four and three quarter inches, which is about the 120 millimeter length, then we would expect a claw length just over 60 millimeters, which is about 2.4 inches. Uh, something I want to point out with these is that these are only male crabs. So if we go to the next slide, this data is from Craig from Maryland, um, and I've included this here because it shows the difference between male and female claws. Um, so he basically did the same exact thing. He measured the relationship between carapace width and claw length. Um, and what he is showing here is that to protect both male and females of that minimum size, you would need a claw length just over two and a half inches. Um, all of these crabs are from Maryland, and the number is only 40 measured here, so it's a really small um, sample size, but I did want to show it because it does differentiate between male and female. And then we also had Josh from New Hampshire submit data. He is doing a study on claw mortality, so what happens if you remove Jonah crab claws, uh, what happens to the Jonah crab. So he has done five laboratory trials, and overall he's found that for just control crabs, so no claws removed, there's 19% mortality. When one claw is removed, it's 56% mortality. And then when two claws are removed, that's 74% mortality. Most of this mortality when claws are removed are occurring in the first six days, um, whereas the control mortality was uh, after two weeks, I believe. So. And then he's also looking at how this affects the feeding of Jonah crabs. Uh, so the long and short of this is just that when you remove claws, they seem to eat less and they prefer to eat things that are soft, such as a already shucked mollusk. Um, but given the time, I'm just going to keep going and start the discussion on the claw fishery. So overall, we're seeing we have claws harvested in six states with a variety of gears. I think we have pretty poor trip level data, but biological data may prove more useful in management. Some of the questions for the board to consider today are, does the board want a claw fishery? If yes, what standard would be best to manage the claw fishery? And who can land claws? Do you have to have a lobster permit or do you have to use a lobster trap? And with that, I will start the discussion. Questions, <coughs> Bill Adler. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for a very good report. Um, I did have a question back when on one of the slides it showed how many pounds, I guess it was, uh, that was brought in in a particular area. Uh, yeah, maybe let's say let's say 2015, 21,232. Uh, Is that the weight of pounds of just claws, not counting the crab? That is my understanding from the data. Yes. All right. All right. So that would mean there's a lot more poundage if you were taking the whole all the crabs. Correct. All right, thank you. Dan. 
And the source of that data is dealer data or trip level reports from fishermen? Trip level reports from fishermen. Other comments, questions? Okay, so, I mean, we, we basically have to decide how to proceed here. Obviously, the importance of this is the main uh, management measure in the, in the crab plan is uh, minimum size. Uh, and if you allow clause to come in, you have, under the current uh, format and plan, uh, you have no assurance they're going to come from legal crabs. Um, so what's the preference of the, of the board on how to deal with this? Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from enforcement on how enforceable these crab claw size possibilities are, if they can tell. And, and um, I mean, I've been very opposed to the landing of claws since we started this, but 74% uh, survivability is, is, I mean, 74% mortality is still better than 100% mortality when you land the whole crab. So I might be open if it's an enforceable rule to considering these things. Mark. The Law Enforcement Committee uh, commented on the, when we commented on the original amendment, um, we of course specified that <coughs> we preferred that crabs be landed whole. Um, we did not really favor having a, cra a, a claw provision in the amendment. Um, I think we'd have to go back and revisit specific standards of claw measurements. The, the comments that were made at the time were that in addition to having the problem of, of uh, potentially <coughs> undersized crabs being used and then just having all claws harvested, which sort of defeats your minimum size requirement, that uh, obviously having to go out then and measure claws along with minimum size carapaces uh, just adds a, a, a much more complicated issue for enforcement either on the water or on the docks uh, to measure claws. But if there are specific types of claw measurement, height or length or uh, specific ranges of claw measurements, then, then we may want to look at that again. All right. Uh, anyone else? Pat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great report, Megan. Um, clarification. Did you mention that there is a relationship to the size of the claw and the age of the animal? I didn't hear that. Um, you know, when you get this old, you don't hear a lot of things. But can you help me with that? Um, I didn't mention that. One of the, I guess, complicating factors I'll say is that uh, if you remove the claw, then then obviously your claw length will be much smaller for a higher aged crab. So all of the measurements that were presented in the first graphs I showed were uh, regenerated claws were removed from that analysis. Analysis, but I don't have what age. Um, yeah, I don't know the age of that crab. Just to follow on, Mr. Chairman, is there a relationship where you could compare the growth of, of these uh, animals to uh, blue crab growth? I, I guess I'm looking for, with blue crabs, there's a size, a minimum size, and I'm wondering if there's a direct relationship between uh, claw growth, claw size, and, and the animal, and whether that may be a measure. I understand what enforcement is saying, and it appears it's another layer of difficulty for enforcement people to go through it based on the number of animals that are being caught. Anyone to that point? I can answer to that. Bob? Um, yeah, based on the work that we're doing at MassDMF that Megan presented, there's a strong positive relationship between carapace width and claw length and also claw height. I would caution the board on the use of claw height because of, of the sub subjectivity in measuring it. Uh, it to get that you can measure the height of the claw at several different places and depending on where you measure that you're going to get its maximum maximum height it's hard to define it would be difficult to define that in regulation so I, I would suggest that if the board were entertaining uh, a claw standard I would strongly advise on the claw length because I think it's more uh, it's easier to comply with and easier to enforce probably and one following mr. chairman um, so would it really make, would it make um, sense to be concerned to setting that in our regulation now or is the status of the stock such that we shouldn't be looking at this and maybe uh, in, a, in an addendum uh, two or three years from now that it would be appropriate for us to bring that back up? In other words, I guess the question is, are we making it too complicated now as we're just going into this new 
uh, approach uh, that we're going to make it difficult for the fishermen and enforcement to really do their job. I don't know if you can answer that question or not, Bob. Or yeah. Megan. Uh, well, I just provide my own insight on this. One of my concerns about this, and I would simply point out that Dan McKernan has, has uh, done yeoman's duty on this particular issue by working with the staff. It's amazing how much time has been consumed on, the, on some of these crab issues. And, you know, this is not a, uh, I would just note, this is not a very big fishery. It's not a major fishery. It's not like people are making a huge amount of money. It's a, a fishery uh, of convenience. You have some fishermen bringing them in for personal con consumption, which I don't view as, as a problem as long as it's small quantities. You have other fishermen uh, in, in New York in particular that bring it in. They want to sell it whole. And then if the market won't accept the whole crabs, they snap the claws off. Uh, and uh, just um, sell uh, the claws. I, I guess my concern is we're going to an enormous amount of work to try, try to, to get this done for a very small group of, of in, individuals. And I, I personally are questioning, at least in my own mind, I'm questioning why we're doing this. It's not, if it's going to be a huge burden on enforcement, you're probably not going to have a lot of enforcement officers who are going to willingly want to get down there and start measuring thousands of claws uh, to see what the compliance rate is. So it might might be simpler. I understand that this might be unpalatable to some people and uh, states, but it might be simpler just to leave the requirement. You have to land the uh, crab hole at the time of, of landing, and then if, in fact, somebody wants to sell claws, they have, they have to butcher them at the dock. But that's just a personal observation. Thank you. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that clarification and what Dan has brought to the table in terms of hours of effort having reviewed this, I would move that we remain status quo on this issue and, and go by the um, recommendation of the Enforcement Committee that we have approved early on in this meeting. Just for clarification, status quo means that it's a whole crab fishery, but claws, those who have a history of landings of claws from New Jersey through Virginia are able to land claws. Jim? I, I, I am going to um, refer to Mr. Gilmore to explain why this doesn't work. Well, can I just point out while, while the two of you are going back and forth that unless we take action to allow this practice, it's not allowed. It's not allowed consistent with the current regulation. Jim. Uh, well, that was my question. I was going to say, I, I agree with you, Dave. If we, um, I don't think we need to deal with this and just leave that there be a claw fishery. However, how do we unravel the fact that we gave exemptions at the summer meeting? So that's, I'm not sure how to fix that right now, because New York clearly has a claw fishery. I think other states do. So um, I'm looking for a suggestion on how we fix that. Megan or Tony, you want to comment on that? So I think my understanding, and Tony, you can correct me, um, I think if you guys want to make it just strictly a whole crab fishery, this would require an addendum to uh, remove those exemptions so that there would be an option for status quo, which would be um, a whole crab fishery with the exemption for the New Jersey through Virginia fishermen, and then a possibility for option two would be strictly a whole crab fishery coastwide. All right, somebody, David Simpson? Yeah, I guess um, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, but I am thinking about the, the burden of measuring individual claws, and I wonder if there's data available on, you know, weight per hundred count or something like that to set a, a guideline. I, I, I remember scallop count days, so I, I know how it will quickly get gamed, but I just can't imagine law enforcement going through and, as you said, measuring hundreds of individual crap, individual crap. So I, I wonder if there's any data on, you know, weight per count. Uh, I don't believe that information exists. Pat Keller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it? Could we add those options as Megan just laid them out to the to the current addendum and bring the, bring these out to public? 
for public comment and then be able to wrestle this after the fact. Megan? So none of that language is currently drafted. Um, I can work to draft that um, quickly if the board is interested in that, but I don't, the board wouldn't be able to see that language. How do I, um, if the board was interested in seeing that drafted language before public comment, we would have to do that somehow electronically. Um, that language has not currently been drafted, but if that is the board's will, we will quickly work to do that. John? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just a little confused because the, <coughs> the plan does allow for the, uh, the retention of the clause only, and the new addendum doesn't have anything about that. So status quo, um, to my understanding, would be that we'd continue to allow claw retention, correct? Megan? Yeah, so this would be, um, I guess, issue three, we'll call it, in the addendum. So it would be a claw. The addendum would address both incidental bycatch and claws. And under the claw issue, there would be, I'm not, I'm not trying to put words into the board's mouth, but two options could be um, status quo, which would be the whole crab fishery with the exemptions for New Jersey through Virginia. And option two could be a strictly whole crab fishery coastwide. I mean, one of, one of the things that I would, I would put out here is that the, uh, one of the concerns is that the, well, I think a number of individuals are rightly worried about an expansion of the fishery. Uh, and when, when we originally um, discussed this, and I, I think I was one of the ones that, that uh, spoke in favor of the claw fishery because of the mid-Atlantic mid uh, situation, if, if we could figure out a way to cap it, for instance, at the existing landings, um, then I could see that working in a conceptual manner um, in, in support of uh, the concept. But, um, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe this is a, a question for Megan. Um, <clears throat> so how does the addendum that we just approved for public comment, how do the trip limits in that addendum apply to the majority of landings under the claw fishery that we're currently discussing such a, such that and my, what I'm thinking about is you know if if through the addendum one process we establish some form of a trip limit on the number of crabs that that are effectively handled and dealt with um, on these incident on these bycatch trips and if those bycatch trips make up 90% of the reported landings of, claw, of these claws that we're talking about right now, then we could essentially use those trip limits as a mechanism for establishing claw limits that would go hand in hand, perhaps in, in some way like that. I, I, I'm, I'm confused about the idea of adding something to the document that we just approved for public comment. Um, before lunch, we just approved addendum one to go to the public and to add something in now, I think, is, is a little last minute, if not already past the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I mean, since there's been no action on that, it, it, my, my suggestion would be let addendum one move forward the way it's currently cast, and if we want to do another addendum, we simply do it. We work out the, I think your advice is well put, that we, we simply uh, start the process, we draft an addendum, circulate the language, let everybody look at it, put it on an agenda for the next meeting. And just to get to your point, Mike, that is one of the questions we do need to solve is who can land um, clause. So if someone is now going to be using a non-lobster trap and they're catching clause, that's something that the board needs to decide um, who can land clause. Mike? Okay, yeah, I, get, I understand the two points. I just want to be clear that I, I wasn't suggesting in my comment that we initiate a new addendum. Um, I was simply saying maybe we should let this other addendum play itself out and then have, on, have an opportunity to see how, the, how this claw issue and the limits that we establish in that addendum can be, can be viewed together. And maybe that would be the guidance we would need to start something if need be. All right, comments on that suggestion? 
What's the uh, preference? I've got a couple of hands up. Um, Eric Reed. <clears throat> I'm good with what Mike said. Let let Addendum One take its course, and I would look forward to having a conversation about a whole crab only fishery and a uh, a limit for personal use, whether it's a pound, a peck, or a pen worth of claws. After that. All right. I got Allie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back in August, um, we commented that we thought it would be hard to justify a claw-only fishery. Allie, you're going to have to pull that microphone closer, please. Can you hear me better now? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, back in August, we commented that we thought it was hard to justify a claw-only fishery without better mortality information. And at that time, um, we supported a, a claw-only fishery. Um, it's, it's good to see that a lot of work has been done on, on this issue in the last few months. Um, but at this stage, I think we'd still support um, a claw-only fishery, given the high level of mortality to um, crabs with one or both claws removed. Um, that being said, I think we'd be supportive of, of the, the process playing out, whether it be through an addendum um, initiated at this meeting or, or in the future. All right, thank you. Jim Gilmore. I'm kind of lost, so I have a couple of questions. So if we let the addendum play out, um, there's four states that have an exemption. So then New York being one of the states that don't have an exemption, we wouldn't have a claw fishery until we started a new addendum to add that in, right. which is not making me particularly happy. So here's a suggestion, um, and hear me out, and, and, and Bob and Tony pay attention because I'm not sure if we can do this or not. That motion that was passed that gave the exemption, and I think, I hope everyone will agree, was based on horrible, actually no data. We essentially did that seat of the pants, and uh, we didn't have the data, and we essentially gave those exemptions. If we had back to that point, and I was sitting here, I would have added my, my state in, and probably other states would. Is there a possibility in a cleaner way to revisit that motion and just take that exemption away and then not deal with the claw fishery so we don't have to do another addendum? Tony? Uh, typically, once we approve an FMP, um, you have approved that FMP in order to make a change in one of the regulations that has been codified. You would need to do an addendum to remove that regulation. OK, so what's the preference here? Anyone want to speak to that vote? Who's good? Pat? I think Jim had his hand up. He wants some clarification. If that's the case, I, I did not want to initiate an addendum on a, on a claw only fishery, but I'm going to be forced to do it because I have to include New York in the fishery. So uh, I can give you that motion now, or uh, what's your preference, Mr. Chairman? Go, go ahead. Do the motion now. All right. Initiate an addendum to create standards and management measures for a Jonah Crab claw only fishery. Second? Anyone? Motion dies due to lack. Oh. Pat? No, you're in the same delegation. <laughs> Bill Adler? Okay, so motion by Jim Gilmore, seconded by Bill Adler. Motion's on the table. Discussion? Dan? Whatever we do in the end on this, we have to ask the National Marine Fishery Service to adopt rules in, in the federal zone that they're going to be comfortable with in terms of the equal protection issues and, and you know, treating states fairly. <clears throat> I just want us to be realistic, and maybe each of us ought to be talking to, to NIMS if we want to have an EEZ fishery for Jonah crabs with rules that pertain to landing in certain states. I, I think that would be unprecedented. And um, I just want us to really think that through. I, I, I just can't imagine that being the case. I'd rather see some kind of a uniform standard applied to the entire fishery, whether it be some nominal amounts, whether it be a prohibition on parts, whether it be parts have to be accompanied by totes of clawless crab, uh, crab bodies. Something has to be consistent. We can't have the motion that was passed in August uh, live on because it won't, it won't be enacted, I don't believe, by NIMS uh, in a final rule. 
Um, one one option here would be to uh, not proceed with with this strategy in terms of the motion, and simply ask NOAA General Counsel to provide us with some written guidance on that for the next meeting. So what's a what's a preference? You want to? I mean, we have a motion on the table uh, uh, that we should vote on in deference to Jim and and Bill. Uh, but if they prefer to, to um, withdraw the motion, I'd be happy to entertain that, and we could seek some uh, legal advice uh, between now and the next meeting on the, is the legal issue that Dan. Jim, have you got a preference? We'll vote on it if you want. Okay with it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, that's, that's okay with me, Mr. Chairman. I would withdraw the motion under that. Okay, Pat Ar August, uh, oh, no, it was uh, Bill Adler. Excuse me. Bill, are you... Comfortable with withdrawing the motion? Okay, the motion's been withdrawn then. Any further action on this? A, le a letter is going to be sent then uh, to the National Marine Fisheries Service asking them about the specific question that Dan raised. Ben. Dennis? Yeah, point of order. Yeah. You can't withdraw the motion. The motion belongs to the board. Okay. Well, uh, the one thing you can do is somebody can mo make a motion to table it. <clears throat> Dan? Motion to table the, the Mr. Gilmore's motion until the next meeting pending a general counsel review from NOAA. Seconded by Pat Augustine. Discussion on a motion to table it? There is no discussion. Uh, uh, are you ready for the question? Need a caucus? No one needs a caucus. All those in favor, raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Eleven in favor, opposed? Uh, no opposition, any abstentions, null votes? Okay, motion passes, motion been tabled. Mr. Chairman, point of information. I don't think Mr. Abbott seconded that. Unless he didn't, I didn't know it. Okay, so, Pat? Yeah. Did Mr. Abbott second that before I did? Up there. Yeah, I think I seconded it, but if Mr. Abbott wants it, he can have it. Uh, excuse me. I think uh, if Mr. Gilmore made the motion, Mr. Augustine's not supposed to second it. That's why I jumped in. This is David's motion. I'm uh, um, Can we move forward? The, the next issue is the implementation plans, and I hope this will go easier than the last issue. <coughs> Megan. All right, so implementation plans for the Jonah Crab FMP were due January 1st. I received plans from all states. Um, I've contacted all the states that had state-specific issues or the PDT was recommending some sort of change, so I'm not going to discuss those today. Um, if a state has a question or concern, you can come talk to me and we'll work it out. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is how to move forward with implementation, given that we have an addendum right now for public comment to alter or potentially alter the incidental bycatch limit. And so what I'd like to hear from the board is how we would want to proceed with that. Does, is the board interested in implementing the incidental bycatch as is now, which again is a 200 crab per day, 500 crab per trip incidental bycatch limit for non-trap gear? Or would the board like to hold off on implementing anything in regards to that specific issue and wait for final action on addendum one? Comment? Jim? Go first. I, I'd like to hold off, take option two for a number of reasons. The um, first off, we, this thing became extremely messy. We got so many pieces to it. I think we have a June first implementation date. I don't even have my rulemaking yet done, and now I'll have to put one in to try to make June first, which typically takes me six months. I'm going to miss that, and I'll have to put a second one in to do this, and it's going to be uh, logistically very difficult to get both those through. So I would prefer to wait. Other comments? 
Any other comments? Any objections to waiting? How long are we going to wait? Megan? So that's something we can discuss in May when we do final action on the addenda. We could discuss implementation of the bycatch limit at that point if people are okay with that. So if each state could come with a date by which they could implement that, that would be great. Any objections to handling it in that manner? Okay. No objections, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, next item is, uh, let's see, the deep sea corals. And I'm going to recognize Doug Grout and possibly uh, Terry. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, as you probably can uh, the uh, New England Fisheries Management Council a number of years ago initiated uh, um, an amendment uh, on deep sea coral habitat. Um, we did uh, set it aside while we were doing the omnibus habitat amendment. We've now picked it up. Uh, during this period of time, uh, one of the things that's been good about delaying is that we have a lot more information about where deep sea corals actually occur based on surveys compared to what we were uh, basing our original uh, amendment on, uh, which was based essentially on habitat. Now we have empirical evidence of it. Uh, one of the issues that's um, uh, the council has asked us to help out with is uh, apparently there's some offshore lobster fishing that is occurring out near some of the deep sea canyons out there um, where some of the deep sea corals have been documented um, but we don't have specific uh, BTR data that uh, outlines exactly where that fishing effort is so they've asked the Commission if we have some other information that may be able to help out with this. Furthermore, because this is a, is, we are potentially going to contemplate applying any measures to uh, a lobster trap fishery uh, out there. Uh, we wanted to have a member of the board here um, participate in the Habitat Committee and our chairman of the lobster board here has graciously uh, agreed to uh, uh, be the Commission's representative on the Habitat Committee uh, for now. So that's basically where we're going with this. Uh, uh, we're going to have a meeting here, I believe, in March. Um, and Megan, do you have anything else you'd like to bring up about it? Yeah, so as Doug was saying, we were asked to provide um, information on the distribution of lobster fishing effort in the canyons um, so that the council can look at the potential economic impact if they were to limit lobster fishing in these deep sea coral areas. So I'm currently working now with a group to draft a survey on that since we don't actually have that sort of detailed information. So that will be being sent out to Area 3 fishermen and our goal is to be able to present that data to the council in April. Um, so I can give more updates as we go, but that's where we are right now. Any questions for Doug or Megan? I, I would just add add to this that I mean one of the one of the issues here is that not all of the the um, the boats that are fishing the canyons have to do uh, uh, complete log books. Um, and so there is a lack of, of information uh, from certain areas. Uh, along the shelf, uh, as, as was uh, stated uh, by um, a number of the offshore representatives. I mean, that entire edge, you can go from the Canadian line all the way down off of New Jersey. That edge, uh, all those canyons are being fished by fishermen up and down. They're either being fished for lobsters, there's a red crab fishery that takes place outside in the really deep water, uh, and then there's a Jonah crab fishery that takes place in the shallower extent. So uh, unfortunately, that information is not well detailed uh, in the database with the result that when the, when the council staff does their 
their um, examination of the issue, uh, they end up with this patchy uh, exposure. So it's really critical to get that information as we move forward. So any further action, Dan? Yeah, David, um, can I recommend for the next meeting uh, you prepare a report or, or consult the National Marine Fishery Service about the potential for requiring VTRs of all federal lobster permit holders? Well, that's, you actually <clears throat> raise a, uh, an interesting question. I, I would now have no objections to doing that, but that's one of the, the issues that the technical uh, team com committee specifically identified as one of the flaws in the I existing plan. And my expectation would be that as we get into fleshing out the details of, of the next amendment, we should look at those recommendations and then include provisions that address some of those data deficiencies. Uh, and uh, so I think it's appropriate. I have no objections if Peter, uh, for instance, would, would like to go back to, to the agency and discuss that internally and then come forward with some advice to the board. I think that's useful, but you've already got a recommendation to do that from the technical people. But can, if to follow up, could you write a letter specifically to NOAA Fisheries on this matter and ask for a response? Sure. Thank yeah. you. Any objection to that? No objection. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a, a short, oh, excuse me, Bob. <clears throat> Just a real quick procedural thing. The, usually if the commission's going to send a letter to NOAA Fisheries, we run that by the policy board just to, to essentially inform all the states that we're requesting uh, some feedback from NOAA Fisheries. All right, we'll follow that, that procedure. Okay, the next item on the agenda is an update on the observer program. And we'll go into the election and hopefully adjourn after that. <clears throat> So I'll keep this really short. One of the issues with the Federal Observer Program was that the sampling frame was quite small. It only looked at VTR fishermen. So I am happy to report that that has been changed. It now looks at all lobstermen that fish in federal waters. So um, whether you report on a VTR or not. So I think that's a really big improvement for the Observer Program. And uh, that went into effect January 1st. Our next task is to try and unif create uniform codes so codes for egg status or shell disease, and we'll be working on that. Any questions for Megan? Okay, uh, next, next item is uh, election of a vice chairman. Floor is open. Jim. I nominate Steve Train from the state of Maine as the next vice chairman for the Lobster Board. Is there a second? Seconded by John. Any other uh, nominations? Pat Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that you uh, close the nominations and cast one vote on behalf of the board for our new vice president, uh, vice chairman, I'm sorry. A Steve. Any objections to that course of action? If not, uh, there's no objections. Congratulations, Steve. I I'm going to be on vacation for the next board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, other business. Uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? If not, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, what you agreed to do today is, is basically we've got a, a schedule a public hearing on Jonah crabs. The lobster PDT has to meet and redefine uh, a number of those, those uh, answers uh, on those questions that uh, they're still working on. Rhode Island has to submit uh, their analysis to the PDT. Uh, we're going to uh, need um, the, the PDT was basically charged to formulate recommendations on goals and management measures that will be considered by the board at the next meeting. We're also going to have a separate discussion on the Gulf of Maine and the overfishing standards. Did I miss anything? If not, uh, any objection to uh, Richie? Uh, Warren. Wasn't the agenda going to include kind of a, a discussion of goals? Uh, yeah, than, okay. that, that was going to be part of it. The, we'll get a recommendation from the PDT uh, on that. So, hey, Jim? Uh, not on that, just uh, Mike, it's vice chairman on the motion. I was trying to help Dave out and get him knocked out quicker, but it didn't work. All right, any, any objection to adjourning? 
If, if not, meeting's uh, concluded. Thank you. We're going to start the herring section in about five or ten minutes. We're, we're running about a half an hour behind, which actually is pretty good given all the things the Lobster Board had to tackle. So as soon as we can get reset, we'll start the herring section. <laughs>